Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to advance in leadership, then this podcast is for you. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker, and Monique Marquez, senior corporate leader, ex-Googler, and diversity expert. From inspiring stories to cutting edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Monica, your host for today's episode. Everyone faces fears, but what some people do better than others is pushing through that fear to get to the other side of it. In our work and personal lives, we make a lot of decisions on a daily basis. And some of those decisions impact other people. How do we stay on track and focus on accomplishing our goals when we face these challenges? Our guest, Dr. Carrie Murphy Healy, is the inaugural president of the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream in Washington, DC. In this episode, she candidly shares stories with us about her two failed runs for office, which led to her winning the position of Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts a much higher position than she originally sought out. Dr. Healy had to overcome a lot of fears of being on stage and on television, but overcoming those fears led to new opportunities. Dr. Healy is full of actionable advice and pearls of wisdom about how to succeed at work and in life. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode including the best way to get in touch with Carrie. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you here. I mean, just when I was reading your background and learning more about you, I was just, it was a phenomenal kind of, you know, experience that you've had in terms of really your career spans, higher education, elected office, foreign and domestic policy. You've done so much work and also championing women entrepreneurs and creating access for students. And so without further ado, I really want to kind of share, you know, with our audience a little bit about who you are, your journey, and kind of what led you on that path and, you know, brought you to where you are today. Well, thank you, Monica. It's wonderful to be here. I was really excited about the idea that you could create change. Mm. And that you could have a, a what people call an impact now. And I think it's wonderful that there's a word for it now and everyone understands impact investing and social impact. But I think when I was growing up, just I just had this notion that I wanted to make a difference in the world, that I wanted to change the world for the better over time. Mm-hmm. And so you can go at that from any number of perspectives. I mean, I think that's one of the wonderful things that we're discovering is that you can do that in business, you can do it in education, you can do it in in a thousand different ways. So when I started out, I, I wouldn't say that I had any clarity about how to do that. But early on, the space that I saw was public policy, of course, because Mm -hmm. what you do matters. And so you could have an impact that way. And so I spent probably the first 10 or more years of my career working for a small public uh, policy firm called Apt Associates in in Mm -hmm. Cambridge, working for the US Department of Justice on criminal justice issues. So domestic violence, child abuse and neglect, um, gang violence and intimidation and incarceration. How do you trans, you know, trans, uh, make your transition from jail or prison back into right. society, all those kinds of issues. So I, I spent 10 years doing that. And, and I have to say that at the end, I felt like I wasn't having impact. Mm. Uh, I felt that even though I had written all of these white papers and articles, uh, and for journals for the lawyers and judges and chiefs of police, I didn't know that anyone had ever read them. You would go to these con- <laughs> conferences and talk about your ideas, but you were, talking to people who were in this echo chamber of mm-hmm. discussion about how to you know, move forward in criminal justice. And I really didn't think that the practitioner on the ground had the time or the energy or sometimes even the interest to learn about what best practices were. And mm-hmm. so my next thought there was, well, how do I get these ideas out there? Because I really was very moved by what I was learning about child abuse and neglect and domestic violence at that time. And I wanted to make it, I, I wanted to make some sort of public impact in that area. And so I thought I'll run for office. Mm-hmm. I think that's the, you know, next obvious way to do it. I have these ideas. I know what government should be doing in mm-hmm. this regard. Why don't I just run for office? And my thought was, even if I lose, so what? 
you know, so what? I will have had the opportunity to have a platform, to go have some debates, yes. to talk about it. And maybe I will have ri ri raised awareness slightly or gotten, you know, someone sparked to think, oh, maybe I should do that. Mm -hmm. And so I ran for office. Oh gosh, for three years, <laughs> you know, before uh -huh. I, uh, I, and I just failed repeatedly. That's all I have to say. Mm. So I, I, I lost in, in 98. I lost in 2000. And then eventually I, I won in 2002 and I, and I, I actually won lieutenant governor, which was, uh, far above where I had initially pitched wow. my efforts. Mm -hmm. But in, in the, in the process of losing and losing and losing, I, I, I started digging in and trying to figure out, well, why is my party always losing? Oh, well, they are in the vast minority in the, in Massachusetts where mm -hmm. I, where I was uh, running for office. I had no numerical path to <laughs> success, <laughs> but I thought, okay, but if you had really good ideas, maybe sometimes people would cross over those party lines and, mm -hmm. and support. Maybe if we had really good candidates. So I became chairman of the Republican Party in Massachusetts, which is about three people, mm. you know, maybe three or four people on a good day. Okay. And we, I went out, recruited Mitt Romney to come back and, and run for governor. Uh, mm -hmm. He had been running the, the Olympics uh, out in uh, Utah at that mm -hmm. time, the Winter uh -huh. Olympics. And, and that gave me the opportunity to actually use my expertise to have an impact for four years mm -hmm. in politics which was something I never thought I would be able to do. Mm. But I found for that moment in time, a way to do that. And then I lost again, and I lost that platform, and uh -huh. I had to go find a new way to have impact and so forth and so on. And that led me to higher education and, mm. and today to building a cultural institution focused on advancing the American dream. Wow, that is phenomenal. Now, the question I have to ask is, you know, you've, you've really made – you know, history, um, in terms of really thinking, you know, just, you know, the first president at Babson College, um, but then, like you said, you, first I'm, woman president, first woman years. president, yes. But I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm fascinated by your courage in terms of jumping into or making transitions and switching gears to lots of different areas that you didn't have experience in. How did you get past? you know, did you have any fears or limiting beliefs? It doesn't seem like it, but you know, how did you keep moving forward in these areas of unknown, like the uncertainty? I, I absolutely had fears. So when I made that first decision back in, mm -hmm. in, in actually 1997 to start running for office, I had never been on television. Mm -hmm. I had given speeches, but they were sort of like reading your speech at a conference of academics. Right. It was not uh, a, an, a, an inspirational speech by any stretch of the imagination. And I really had to go out and acquire those skills. And mm. I will never forget the first time I debated my opponent on television. I was in a very cold uh, TV studio and we were both sitting there and there was the moderator. And I started chattering so hard <laughs> that my teeth were, were literally chattering together and I was convulsing. I was shaking on, on stage. And, and the poor moderator, and when the camera was off me, you know, he was looking at me like, are you all right? Is it going to be okay? Cause I thought <laughs> I was just going to pass out right there on stage. You know? Right. And, and e eventually over time, I learned to wear long underwear. I learned to, you know, figure out how to control adrenaline in those kinds of situations. Mm. Eventually, after I left office, even, even after running for governor, I realized I still really didn't like cameras. And so I started a small TV company and I did uh, a TV series on innovation, uh, called Shining City. It's, it's, so uh, it's a little bit evergreen. You can still find <laughs> bits and pieces of it on the internet somewhere, but, um, but, but I, thought, okay, well, what if I'm the person doing the interviews? Mm -hmm. Will I feel more in control then? Will I understand what it's like to be in your shoes, Monica, right? Asking right. questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are, what are you looking for out of this, this situation that we're right. having right now? Mm -hmm. And, and so by, by slowly acculturating myself to the things that were most unpleasant for me mm. as, as part of being an effective, advocate for mm -hmm. the causes and the concerns that I wanted to advance, I knew I had to develop these, these skills that, that were uncomfortable for me. 
So forcing myself repeatedly to do things that were uncomfortable and that scared me, it, that that's the way eventually to taking off all of the edges and just being able to do whatever you need to do. Wow, that's phenomenal. And, and I, I think that's, you know, exactly like you said, the idea of just facing your fears and kind of like, you know, doing the put making yourself uncomfortable, right? Disrupting yourself before you got disrupted, right? Of identifying what is it that you need to learn. I think that's uh, phenomenal advice and great insight. I would also add, though, that failure helps. Mm. Failure, yes. it feels awful. Uh, the first time it happens and it doesn't feel much better the second or third time that it happens. But eventually it's demystified. If you mm -hmm. fail and fail again and you're still alive and you're still able to be friends with people, have a family, have a career, go on and do other interesting things, then so what? So you failed. It's not a big deal. And, and I think people often think that failure is permanent or, yes. or, you know, failure is somehow, you know, it, it's decisive that you'll never succeed again. And the only way that happens, the only way it can be decisive is if you don't ever try again. Mm. That is actually very insightful. And I love that you actually mentioned that because I think failure is something that we find a lot of the women who we work with through be throughout Beyond Barriers, um, the fear of failure is usually what stops them from advancing in their careers because one, there's self-doubt and all types of things. But unlike what, you know, some of the examples that you've done is like you just leaned into it and you move forward despite the fear, I think is are phenomenal examples of that it can be done, right? And that embracing the idea of failure that the failure sometimes brings you clarity, right? Of like what not to do or, or how you have to pivot. So clarifying, so <laughs> clarifying. So, you know, one of the most clarifying things about failure is you know who your friends are. Mm, that you is... know who you can rely on. Yes, yes. Because they're still there in the morning. And that is so insightful. You know, politicians will tell you the quietest day in their life is the morning after they lose an election. Mm, wow. That is profound. And, and so who's, who is still there? Who is with you throughout? Who values you for who you were before you failed, mm -hmm. but also before you succeeded? Mm -hmm. And those are the people who are going to, to be with you long term. And there are some people who take it too far and say, I'll never be friends with anyone I didn't know, after, you know, before fifth grade or, yeah. you know, in college, you know, when people couldn't possibly have known I was going to be successful. But you can add friends over time. Mm -hmm. But those periodic down moments, they're the ones that are clarifying and you know who your friends are and who you can depend on afterwards. Wow. What if you could pinpoint the invisible ceilings limiting your success? Imagine having clarity on your strengths and barriers so you can take action and gain unstoppable momentum to advance as a future ready leader. Well, that's exactly what the Beyond Barriers quiz will help you discover. You'll get your personalized score based on the 25 essential elements proven to accelerate success in the digital age, so you can understand what's holding you back and where to focus your efforts. The Beyond Barriers quiz is completely free and takes just a few minutes. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com slash quiz and take the quiz today. So I want to shift gears and in, in because in your career on the political front and, you know, some of those things like you have to have perspective and, you, you know, you have to be courageous enough to put your perspective out there. And it's kind of like you're making these decisions, but we all know when you decide, you divide. And there's going to be the people who are the naysayers and the people who are the supporters. How do you make decisions and these tough decisions um, and, you know, and able to kind of like, you know, move forward, even when you have people kind of trying to tear you down because of the perspective or the decisions you've made? Yeah. So I love I love that phrase when you decide you divide, but I'd like to push back on it just a little bit. Sure. So so let's say when you decide, you allow for a conversation. Mm. Because it's very hard to have that conversation unless someone has a point of view and someone else has another point of view. Now, whether it's divisive is pretty much up to you. Mm -hmm. 
And it's up to the person who you're speaking with. So I would always try to make my point clear, my stance clear, but do it in a way that allowed for the human dignity of the person on the other side. Mm. And as long as you can maintain that dignity on both sides, then you're talking about ideas. Then you're Mm. talking about public policy. You're talking about how to get to a mutually uh, desired outcome. Right, right. What's the best path? Not what's my path, what's your path, what's the right path, what's the wrong path, what's the best path. Hmm. And so I would like and I would hope that over time, deciding and having a view, having a point of view, even having a a, a pretty strongly held and inflexible point of view, shouldn't make it that you need to dehumanize the person on the other side of that view in order to hold it. Mm-hmm. And and this is a reciprocal agreement that people need to become uh, aware uh, that they are participating in. You know that you you know if if I decide not to disrespect you for the values mm-hmm. that you hold, perhaps you will decide to listen to me and perhaps disagree with me, but respect me nonetheless mm-hmm. as a, as a human. I love that, and I love how you said you know you you do when you make a decision, you leave that you know, you leave it open for like the hearing the other perspective. It's it's all about the diversity of thought, right? And trying to understand the other person as well. And I loved how you said there's no right or wrong path. It's the best path, right? And that you come to a consensus and can move forward together. Um, I think that is phenomenal. Now I want to shift gears and ask a little, you know, you've, you've done so many different things. And then after the, the political career, you went to academia to higher education and you became the first woman president at Babson College. How did that, like, you know, how, how did you, you know, when in doing that transition, how did you identify or the competencies or the things that you would need to do to do that job. And I ask because research has shown time and time again that, you know, women tend to not raise their hand or go for these big opportunities if they can't check the box, like check all the boxes on the job description. Um, what would you, you know, how would you respond to that? Well, first of all, I did not check the boxes on the job description. I had <laughs> not been a lifelong academic. I had not written, you know, research papers that anyone would have considered to be primary research. I had, I had, you know, been writing think tank papers that were about policy. Certainly not the kind of academic research that you you associate with college presidents. Mm-hmm. Um, I had not been in academia other than to be a fellow at some universities to teach as an adjunct. I was mm-hmm. an unlikely character. So, you know, the good news is that the board of trustees at that time, uh, were looking for, for skills and characteristics. And that's actually how I always try to think of my qualifications as well. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, well, what skills, you know, do I have and how can I apply those skills? So how did I end up at a think tank initially? I I ended up at a think tank because I was doing my PhD. So what were my skills? research and writing. So, right. okay, well, the only place that wants research and writing is probably a think tank. So I'm going to go there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in terms of politics, I was thinking, well, what are my skills? I actually know what to do. I actually know what policies would be effective. And certainly government needs that, whether or not they want that or not is an entirely different matter. Right. And, right. and so I thought, okay, well, my skills are needed in this, in this next field. When it came to, to Babson, um, I had experience fundraising. I had been fundraising for political campaigns for nonprofits for a number of years. That's certainly something that they need. Um, colleges need spokespeople. Mm-hmm. And over those years, I had developed uh, skills as a spokesperson, uh, painfully, as, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> yes. wasn't a natural evolution, but, um, but I had developed those skills. So I could speak on behalf of, of the college. I had also developed a genuine appreciation of what they did. It was a college of entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And when I was in, uh, when I was in public office, everyone was coming to people in government constantly and saying, create jobs. We need more jobs. We need better jobs. We need better paying jobs. We need jobs in this part of this, the, the, the state or that part of the state. And in truth, the only government, the only jobs government can create are, are government jobs. And so you can take down obstacles to mm-hmm. help other people create jobs. And what, what became really clear to me was that it was entrepreneurs who created jobs. Yes. 
It was people who are in the innovation economy. It was small business entrepreneurs. I call them entrepreneurs as well. Small business people are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're starting their own business. They're running their own business. If they grow it a lot, then they look like big business. And, and so it would be much easier, I think, for people to achieve prosperity and for the economy to grow if we had a, a very entrepreneurial culture. Yes. So I believed strongly in the mission of the institution at, at Babson. And so, and so for me, looking at it, I, I thought, okay, I've managed a large budget. They have large budgets at college. You know, I, I believe in the mission. I think I can help them raise money. I can be a good spokesperson. I like people. I believe in education. I believe education is the doorway to success for any number of people. Yes, and I yes. thought that I, I could bring something to that discussion, not the typical things that, that college presidents bring, but, but a needed set of skills. So if you can just start thinking of yourself as a bundle of skills, yes. you can start fitting into a lot of different boxes. I love what you said in terms of really kind of focusing on your skills and competencies that you had that would allow you to do the job, right? You didn't have to have the experience per se, but it was just you had the competencies and the skills to do that. And I think that is a great example for, you know, all who are listening to this podcast to understand that you don't have to check all the boxes, just, uh, you know, have a, have the confidence and the courage and the belief that you can do it and leverage those competencies and skill sets to, to gain that. I love yeah, it. And you're, and you're right. I think it's what, what 70% men, men feel like if they've got 70% of yes. the, uh, of the qualifications needed for a particular or listed for a particular job that they should apply, mm -hmm. women actually want every single one of them before yes. they'll apply. So yes, absolutely. And I think that's the, that's where we have so much missed opportunity where, you know, we, uh, want to have the experience and the opportunity passes you by. So it's just uh, one of those things where, you know, it's that, you know, 80, 20 rule, 70, 30 rule, whatever you want to say, well, no. want is just like, and, let's just and move And people are constantly offering women training courses as a result, whether it's in politics or mm -hmm. whether it's trying to get on boards or whatever, and as if more training is going to do it. Like eventually, you know, we'll train these women enough so that they feel that they're competent, that they can do it. You just have to take a leap. Mm -hmm. Yes, you need information, but you are probably fine the way you are. Mm. So can you tell me a little bit about mentorship and sponsorship? Because some of the, some of the, you know, the roles and the jobs that you've acquired, um, are very much male dominated. Um, how did you identify mentors and sponsors and did they always look like you? Well, first of all, there weren't too many mentors or sponsors who would look like me, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, right. you know, in the, in the, in the positions where I was going. And, um, so yes, I had, I had male mentors. I had male sponsors, mm -hmm. uh, in some areas. In others, I just didn't have any. Mm. And so I've put a lot of effort into trying to mentor and sponsor younger people and trying to, look at the people around me and think, well, where could they move? Where could they go? What, where could their career path be? And I, I take enormous uh, pleasure and satisfaction out of seeing uh, young people's careers progress. Yeah. And so I, I, it's a, it's a secret, which uh, my schedulers know that I never say no <laughs> to, uh, you know, to requests to speak about, you know, people's careers, their, their, their ambitions, et cetera. And it doesn't seem like it's important always. It may seem a little bit you know, like a waste of time on a particular day, but you'll never know. And I, and I think that it's important once you have uh, had some, some amount of success to, to start looking to see who you can bring along with you, how you can help them, how you can just give them support and suggestions. Uh, I think that's phenomenal in terms of always thinking about how you bring them along with you and, yeah. and, um, you know, just, just keep grooming them and grooming those like new leaders and champions. Um, I have a question in terms of community. So one of the things that we see constantly and the research shows it, you know, women and not tapping the, you know, all of the resources in their community and asking for help. And just based on, you know, your experiences and the things that you did, it required 
a village to help you accomplish some of these things. How did you gain cro- proximity to influential people or, you know, really kind of build those strategic relationships and get the courage to just ask for help? How did you do it? Yeah. So being a community volunteer probably was the first step. And most of that building happened really early on in my 30s. One of the first things that I did was I decided to uh, raise money to build a new uh, library in my community. Mm -hmm. And that required me to meet up with other people who loved libraries and and go out and find funders who loved libraries and meet the mayor and of my little town who you know sort of put put a coat around me and said well little woman you know out you go thanks you know, thanks very much <laughs> um but i but we did it we we raised the money we built the library and that gave me enough courage that i could raise money that i did know some people in the community that i thought okay well now i can run for office and so mm-hmm. when i ran for office i failed miserably as i mentioned earlier but after that, people knew about me. They knew my my resume. They knew what I cared mm-hmm. about. They knew where I stood on some issues. And suddenly, I was invited to join the local Rotary Club. I was invited invited to join the local Friends Board of the hospital. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, I, I was suddenly integrated into that community. You know, I did things for the United Way. It's su- it suddenly um, opened up all those doors to community action. And mm-hmm. so, I would say volunteering. And, and letting yourself become known through your community is one of the first ways that, um, that, that you can actually assemble a, a community that can then help you. And that giving first model mm-hmm. is probably the best thing that I can suggest that, you know, when I'm thinking about networking, right, I right. always think about when I meet someone, who else can I introduce them to who will uh, advance their career? Or who will be interested in what they're doing? It might have nothing to do with me, but if I, you know, know that these two people are interested in in opening a particular kind of business, I will introduce them. And it may not seem like it's going to assist me in the long run, mm-hmm. and it may not. But but they will always remember that I was the person who brought them together with this wonderful person who they now have a, a friendship with or a partnership with. And, and that creates this, this extended stronger community. Yes. I, I like to call it reciprocity in terms yeah. of, you know, just kind of putting goodwill into this big bucket and, you know, and then it gives you that, you know, feeling of, okay, now I can ask for some back because I've put a lot of good out in the world and, and I need a little help myself. And um, you may not even have to ask. Exactly. You know, it, 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 and people may just think of you then, you know, as someone who was helpful to them at a moment when they needed it. And, mm-hmm. and so it, it just, it just smooths that, that path. You can't really just join a community and say, what is this community going to do for me? You really have to put something into that community first. Yes. I, I, I totally believe in really just, um, the idea of how can you, how can you help others? Now, one of the questions that we get a lot is that sometimes women don't, or they undervalue what they have to offer in terms of really identifying that value card of, you know, what can they offer others? How did you, you know, at the end of the day, like you, you were sharing some examples, but what would you, what would you tell women who are listening to this of who sit there and say, well, I can't reach out to so and so, or, or what do I, what do I even have to offer? How would you answer that question? I would say that what you have to offer always starts at the ground level. Mm. And after failure, you have to start out at the ground level to rebuild. And you should never be worried or scared or afraid to just start from scratch. Mm. And that's how you build value. And one of the easiest ways, again, is going back to this notion of volunteering for things that you care about. That's a way to build skills when you can't build them any other way. That's You can see your value. Mm-hmm. In, in that equation very easily. And a lot of those skills can translate, uh, to the workforce. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult sometimes to necessarily be able to see clearly what your value is. But mm-hmm. again, thinking about skills, thinking about what you can contribute to, to your community will help you. Mm, I love that. And I wanted to backtrack a little bit. You talked a little bit about how important visibility is. Like you said, when you first ran, you failed miserably, but what it gave you was visibility. People knew who you were after that. And then you were able to kind of be successful and build upon that visibility. Um, but part of that whole visibility too is a little bit of the self-promotion. 
and women have this adverse reaction to self-promotion. Can you talk a little bit about that and how maybe you embraced it and how you were able to really um, leverage that idea of, of self-promotion in a way so that you could get yourself elected and, and do all of these other things? Okay, so I didn't embrace it. I still can't <laughs> embrace it. I still find it horribly frightening. And uh -huh. I, you know, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on LinkedIn. I'm not on, you know, any of these things that you should be doing if you're trying to create uh, an identity for yourself that you are crafting. And I'm sure that my my new advisors here at the Center for Advancing the American Dream will correct all of those faults. <laughs> on me. But, but um, what women are comfortable with doing and what I was comfortable with doing is talking about issues, talking about things that we care about. And if you ask women why they go into politics, they go into politics because they care about something. Mm -hmm. They don't go into politics because they think they'd be a great congressperson or senator or, or, or state representative. They, they say, you know, I'm concerned about what's happening at my child's school or, you know, my, my mother doesn't have health care. And, and I'm, I'm worried about what's going to happen to her as she ages. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I, I'm going to go into politics so I can talk about that issue, mm -hmm. about the importance of, of healthcare or schools or, or whatever it is that you care about, the environment, you know, whatever it is that you feel passionately about. And so women feel much more comfortable talking about what their passions are, what they mm -hmm. believe mm -hmm. in. Um, and especially if it's caring for others. Mm -hmm. than they ever will talking about why they're so great and why they should have power. <laughs> so, so I think it's a really hard, you know, mm -hmm. thing to jump over to get into that self promotional space. But if you can be identified with the issues that you care about, then it's mm -hmm. not really about you. It's, it's that you're a good advocate. The thing that you can say about yourself that I think no one should be ashamed. Uh, to say is that, that you're, you're a strong advocate, that you believe in what you believe and that you're, you know, you're going to try to take care of this thing that is going to make the world a better place. Fantastic. And that's a great segue to my last question before we jump into our lightning round. But, um, you know, again, one, one of the first, you're the inaugural president of the Milken Center for, um, advancing the American dream. Um, under your leadership, what do you hope to, you know, what, what are your, what are your goals and visions? Like, what are you, what are you hoping to accomplish in the near future? Yeah. I, I hope to create pathways, uh, to success and, and whatever dream you are seeking, mm -hmm. uh, to, to make you feel like you've been a success. I realize now after talking to so many people about their, their American dream, their dreams in general, mm -hmm. that no two people have the same dream. There's, there's no one American dream. And so the question is, how do we help people feel optimistic, but not unrealistically optimistic mm. about their ability to find that path? A lot of what you talk about is finding pathways to success. Mm -hmm. And so at the Center for Advancing the American Dream, we're going to have exhibits, we're going to have educational opportunities, we're going to have uh, programming, research, all focused on how do you remove the obstacles that from people's paths as they seek to fulfill them themselves and their mm -hmm. dreams. And, and how can we help people see that pathway? So they, so they know where to go. They mm -hmm. know what to do. Not everyone has mentors. Like I said, I didn't have mentors, yes. but yeah. right now with technology, everyone should be able to have a mentor. Everyone should be able to talk to someone or see a film uh, about someone who had exactly the characteristics that they did, had exactly yeah. the same challenges, the same background, the same country of origin, everything. And we are co now compiling 10,000 American Dream videos. And we hope to put these together in such a way that they're an archive so that people can say, you know, I'd like to find, you know, find the, the story of someone who is a first generation American mm -hmm. from, you know, Arkansas who wants to be a teacher and had these, you know, struggles to get over in their life. And they should be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at a lot of different ways to give people hope and pathways. Wow. That is phenomenal. And thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, so we're going to jump into our lightning round, which is one of the favorite parts. So we can learn a little bit about you uh, that, you know, most people wouldn't hear in an interview. Uh, so quick, five quick questions. Uh, what book has greatly influenced you? 
So I've been thinking about this recently. Uh, it's, it's Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. Mm. And I read it when it was first published in English, um, in, in 1974. Uh -huh. Um, I was 14 years old and it was the first time I had ever really understood what it meant for people not to be free, mm. for people to be imprisoned unfairly, to understand what it would be like to be in a culture where you could be thrown into jail or, or prison for your ideas. Right. Um, and, and the suffering that, that was involved with living in a country that was not a free country. And so I think that ultimately motivated me uh, to want to uh, improve and protect uh, our American freedoms as much as, as I could throughout my life. But I'm sure that it led me ultimately into politics. Wow, that's fascinating. And that's deep reading for a 14-year-old. That's phenomenal. Yeah, I was I a it. strange 14-year-old, I'm sure. <laughs> We've got to embrace it. Embrace the strange. I was too. Yeah. What is your favorite inspiring quote or saying? So I love Nelson Mandela's quote about, and I, I want to get this right, um, I, I never lose, I only win or learn. Mm, yes. And that is the best way to think about failure, I can imagine. And it's certainly something that I've tried to teach my kids that, you know, every failure is a learning experience, just keep going. I love that. What is one word or moniker you would use to describe yourself? I'm optimistic. Optimistic. I love it. I, d I don't like the alternatives. <laughs> what is one change, a habit, behavior, or action you implemented that made you better? Sleeping, learning really? to make time for sleep. So that is a great one. I, sleeping is so important. And I think people are beginning to understand how important it is. But for years, um, one of the, one of the things that men would brag about at corporate events was how little they slept. Mm -hmm. And, and how little you slept actually seemed to be even a, um, it was, it was a determinant of, of how capable you were. Like a badge of honor. <laughs> you were, right? Yeah. It's like, like I can do all this on, you know, I never sleep. I, you know, right. I do this on two or three hours of sleep a night and I'm still, you know, running 50 corporations and so forth. And I remember just sitting at a, at a table once when I was lieutenant governor and I was there with the head of a, a, a of a major international corporation and a senator and, and, and another corporate leader. And they were all in turn talking about how little they slept. And it got around to me and I said, I like to sleep eight or nine hours a night. <laughs> I think that's really important. <laughs> <laughs> and the science is coming around to me. You're you're less stressed. You're you're going to have better memory as you get older, and you're you're just going to be healthier all around. So I, I mm. shamelessly sleep. It's so important. And then finally, one of my favorites: What power song would you want playing as you walked out on stage? Okay, so this is embarrassing because this is actually a <laughs> question I've had to discuss with consultant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> You've walked on many stages, so yes. So you back have in that the song. day, uh -huh. the only the only songs you could come on stage to were primarily U two songs. Uh, preferably, it's a beautiful day. Yeah. <laughs> so, like that was that was yeah that was it. That was like it's a beautiful day. They're like completely innocuous. It was upbeat. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, if I had to do it over again, I probably would want "Take Me to the River" by the Talking Heads. Oh, I love it! Fantastic. But well, I don't think anyone would let me do that. <laughs> well, Dr. Healy, thank you so much for the time that you have given us here at Beyond Barriers. I am sure our audiences are going to so much enjoy this episode and re-listen to it because you had some amazing insights and pearls of wisdom. Um, and we always get this. We always have individuals reaching out wanting to know how can they follow you? How can they get in contact with you? What's the best way for someone to follow you or get in touch? Okay, so we, we have uh, our website, which is mm -hmm. www.mcaad.org. So the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream.org. And mm -hmm. we are on Twitter and Facebook and all of those um, social media streams as well. I also have a podcast, my own podcast yes. called Start Small, Dream Big, focused on the experiences of uh, small business people from around the country in every possible area. So 
please join us as well. Come see me. Yes, absolutely. And we'll be sure to put all of that in the show notes on our website and you'll be able to just click and get in touch with Dr. Healy. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Monica. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes, links, and the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.